The entire fourth floor of the elite office center was occupied by Polar. The name itself didn't reveal anything about the company's specialization, but it spoke volumes to those clients who had the honor of meeting its director and sole owner. Daniel Bryant was a solid man, confident in his irresistibility. The touch of grey in his thick hair didn't bother him at all, rather. It seemed to indirectly justify or explain his lifestyle. He often ran his hand through his curly hair, and a smug smile frequently graced his face. The firm had few women in leadership positions, but secretaries, assistants, and various aides were primarily selected based on two criteria they had to be not only attractive but also agreeable and compliant. Mr. Bryant enjoyed what he called hunting for game, and like all hunters, he always aimed to capture every trophy that caught his eye. Once he achieved his desire, he would play with his prey for a while, savoring his victory and enjoying the affection of young, naive girls. However, he quickly grew bored of them, and instead of the promised marriage to a wealthy businessman and a comfortable life, they received their final paycheck from accounting. Some left ashamed and disappointed, while others tried to fight and cause a scandal, but nothing came of it. They were simply fired and forgotten, with a new candidate soon filling the vacant position. Daniel continued to sail through life like a grand white ship, ignoring the small boats and plastic debris, sometimes drifting past his impregnable sides. He had a very straightforward view of women considering them not his equals but mere toys in his hands, cute little creatures for entertainment. It was rumoured that in his youth he had been deeply in love and even married, though it was brief and unsuccessful. After that, his attitude towards all women changed, becoming purely utilitarian. His subordinates tolerated this and tried to avoid flaunting their wives at corporate events. However, as a businessman, he was very smart and professional, assembling a strong team of similarly skilled professionals in key positions. This became the foundation of his successful business and the company's rapid growth. The local market was becoming too small for them, and the question of expanding internationally was increasingly raised. Asian countries were seen as the primary target for their expansion. There was a large market for their products there, and it was easy to find reliable partners. The main obstacle was the lack of experienced specialists in this area of foreign trade, especially those fluent in the languages and familiar with the local cultures and traditions. The active search by the HR department yielded no results. They often joked among themselves that they were searching for something they didn't know and it lived somewhere they didn't know. They could only hope for a miracle, and one rainy day, a miracle walked into the HR department. Shaking the last drops of autumn rain from the hood of her coat, she turned out to be a very charming 28-year-old brunette with experience in handling contracts in the countries they were targeting, fluent in the local languages and cultures, and, to top it off, with a perfect figure, ball like face, and melodic voice. And as the first few months of her work showed, she also had brains in that pretty head of hers. Karen quickly grasped the specifics of the company's products and easily navigated the directions of her search. Her first business trip brought the firm two major clients with contract prices significantly higher than expected. Skeptical glances in her direction turned to admiration and deep respect. Everyone in the company soon realized just how valuable an employee she was. Behind her model-like appearance was a sharp mind and truly deep knowledge of legal nuances and the national peculiarities of doing business. In addition, many appreciated her calm demeanor and gentle appearance, as well as her politeness, intelligence, and refined behavior. Many colleagues attempted to court her, but she gently and firmly made it clear that she would never mix personal relationships with professional interests, and that she absolutely disapproved of any form of workplace romance. The men didn't persist or take offense instead, they respected and admired her even more. 
Everyone liked the new colleague and appreciated that with her arrival profits significantly increased, resulting in good bonuses for everyone. A substantial salary increase was even being planned, and the entire team eagerly awaited the moment when the director would finish his current pursuit and shift his attention to Karen. But she wasn't the type to act foolishly or submissively for the sake of her career or to catch a wealthy suitor. Such behavior could quickly lead to losing such a valuable employee, along with all her achievements and financial benefits. It was unlikely they would find a worthy replacement for her, but Karen could always find a good job elsewhere. The climax was approaching, and another unnecessary trophy had just been dismissed. Oh Lord, now Mr. Bryant will start hunting Karen, and many employees' dreams of higher salaries will collapse, everyone thought. But Karen timely left for another round of negotiations and was absent for nearly a month. By the time she returned, the predator was already occupied with another prey. The HR department had managed to find a charming blonde to replace the previous victim. Some in the office even suspected that Karine, with her intelligence and insight, had deliberately waited for Daniel to start hunting the new blonde while HR kept her informed of developments. It was understandable they also wanted higher salaries and not the trouble of finding a replacement for Karen. Among themselves, they unanimously decided that Karen was irreplaceable. They needed to protect this rare, one-of-a-kind asset. Besides, they liked her very much. They didn't want her to face such unpleasantness and distress. And everyone in the office had no doubt that there would be troubles and worries if Daniel's personal interests clashed with Karen's principles. While previously the men had watched the hunting process with interest and even placed symbolic bets on how long the citadel of innocence would last against particularly naive chickens in Karin's case, they were sure of a negative outcome and its consequences for the company. Everyone sided with Karin. She wasn't just another silly, empty-headed doll lured by the easy money of an older, yet wealthy suitor. She was always kind and willing to help colleagues when needed they no longer hesitated to ask her for advice. She would never humiliate someone asking for help with a haughty handout instead. She would support and kindly try to help find a solution to seemingly hopeless situations. For another two months, Karen worked calmly until the blonde bored the boss, and Karen once again set out to find new clients and engage in long negotiations for lucrative contracts. Meanwhile, the HR director, Mr. Brooks, and his assistants hastily conducted a prey, casting, as they called it among themselves. They fished a bright red-haired vixen, Camilla, out of the pool of long-legged candidates and presented her to the management. The HR team relaxed and Karen returned home safely, loaded with new promising contacts and even more profitable contracts. Life in the company flowed on, as usual. Everyone watched as Daniel tried to catch the fiery trickster in his nets, but Camilla was a true fox, leading the experienced and confident hunter on for a whole six months, flirting with him without getting caught, further inflaming his already intense passion. While following the twists and turns of the new exciting hunt, almost no one in the office noticed the changes happening in Corinne. She seemed tired, sad, and constantly worried. Then she asked the accounting department for an income statement for the bank. They were surprised. Karen had a good salary and big bonuses from all the contracts. Did she really need a loan? But another twist in the fox hunt distracted them from these questions. The accounting department revisited the issue when Karen approached them again, asking to transfer almost her entire salary to an account in a German bank. It seemed strange and suspicious. Memories of the documents for the banks came to mind. The chief accountant and both HR officers entered Karen's office, closed the door tightly behind them, and began to ask gentle questions. They didn't want to assume anything sinister, but this wasn't something trivial. Did she have financial problems? Was someone blackmailing her? Could they help in any way? 
Should they contact the police or hire private security? Or maybe a detective? No detectives or security guards. They won't help, Curran said wearily. She picked up a small photo frame from the desk, always facing her but hidden from visitors by the computer monitor. She ran her hand over the glass as if gently caressing someone in the picture. She handed the frame to Mr. Brooks, the HR manager standing closest to her. A small, smiling copy of Karen looked back at him from the photo. Mr. Brooks didn't notice at first, but then he saw that the girl's eyes were blue, unlike her mother's brown eyes. This is my daughter, Eva, and there's no one else in my life but her. And she has cancer, with the only hope being a clinic in Germany. They don't perform such operations here, so I'm trying to find money wherever I can. I'm attempting to sell my apartment, but it won't be enough. And time is running out. We have no more than two months left, while the operation can still help. It's terrifying to look at your daughter and realize that you're powerless, Karen spoke calmly and slowly, which made her words sound even more hopeless. The men remained silent for a long time, not knowing how to comfort the always calm and composed Karen. They watched as transparent tears suddenly started streaming down her cheeks. This was so unexpected and unlike her that they were completely at a loss. Karen had always been calm and composed. They had never seen any emotions from her at work. Always polite and correct, responsive, but now such pain in her eyes, in her voice, tears that wouldn't leave anyone indifferent. Then they tried to pull themselves together and began offering their help, but after hearing the cost of the operation and treatment, they fell silent and gave up. They could ask for help from the entire team, and surely everyone would give as much as they could. No one would refuse Karen, especially for such a cause. But it still wouldn't be enough. We have to do something. We have to ask our colleagues, they decided. With this resolution, the HR officers and the chief accountant left Curran's office and got to work immediately. Rumors spread around the office faster than cockroaches in a kitchen. Soon everyone knew and sympathized with the young woman. People came to HR and accounting, donating significant amounts. Everyone wanted to help and support, but everyone understood that this help was like a drop in the ocean. Amidst such a significant event, Everyone missed the conclusion of the fox hunt. It turned out that it wasn't a hunt for foxes, but rather the red-haired Camilla deliberately flaunted herself in front of Daniel while she had long been the lover of his main competitor and was trying to spy, taking advantage of the director's well-known weakness. When Mr. Bryant found out the truth, she fled instantly, just shaking her curly red hair one last time. Daniel was incredibly angry at the entire female gender for the deceit and lies of the red-haired spy. A volcano of past and new grievances raged within him, and this one too was like his ex-deceitful and treacherous, cruel and heartless. When rumors about Karen's child's health problems reached Daniel, he suddenly remembered this yet unconquered hostile female territory and rushed to the attack. His wounded pride demanded revenge, and immediately, after clarifying all the details of the child's situation, the absence of a husband or other family members, Daniel decided to storm the fortress without delay. He summoned Karen for an urgent meeting. Evening was approaching, but no one left work, everyone waited to see what would happen. You are a smart woman, and I won't play cat and mouse with you. I'll be straightforward. If you come home with me now and spend the night, I will fully cover the cost of your daughter's treatment. I would gladly do it, if it weren't for one thing. And what is keeping you from saving your only child? I am Sophie Ziner's daughter. My mother always told me about you. She said you were a wonderful person, that you loved her deeply and tenderly and how her closest friend Abby came between you. When my mother realized she was pregnant with me and came to tell you, you were already married to Abby. Abby drove my mother away without letting her speak to you. 
She forbade her from coming back and ruining her happy family since she was already your wife and expecting your child. My mother moved to another city so as not to trouble you any more. She gave birth to me and raised me all by herself. She loved only you her entire life and remained faithful to you. Until her death she never looked at another man, despite being beautiful and having many suitors. As soon as Daniel heard this name, sweat broke out on his forehead, and memories of those years surfaced in his mind. Daniel had always looked older than his age. Girls chased him even before he turned sixteen. By the age of twenty-five he was already a well-established man and businessman. Of course his father's money, which was invested in him and his business, played a significant role. Daniel was a very attractive catch for the local beauties, but he was not easily won over. He looked down on women, mainly because he couldn't believe in their sincerity. He met Sophie by complete accident. He was leaving his office, and she was entering. They collided because the girl wasn't looking where she was going. She was closely studying a piece of paper with an address on it. The collision was so strong that the girl was thrown against the door. She looked up at him with eyes full of pain and, rubbing her elbow, said, I'm so sorry, I'm always so inattentive. Daniel was about to tell her to be more careful but looked into her eyes and was lost in them. The girl continued, Could you tell me where the HR department of this company is in this building? She showed him the note. Daniel offered to escort her. The company was just one floor below theirs. The girl was nervous and seemed to talk a lot because of it. Were you also here about a job? Daniel was a bit taken aback, but then decided to lie a little it wasn't a crime. Yes, at the company upstairs. And how did it go? I got the job. Why? Well, thanks, maybe I'll be lucky too. The girl disappeared behind the door, and Daniel left the building, deciding to wait for her. She came out after only fifteen minutes, looking bewildered. He approached her immediately. How did it go? They didn't take me. They need experience, and how could I have that? The girl smiled. But it's okay, I'll find something else. Do you really need a job that badly? Are there people who don't need one? Of course I have a home and an aunt who loves and supports me, but I'm an adult now and I should help my aunt too. Daniel wasn't used to such conversations. After all, his usual acquaintances could chat about furs, jewellery, or at the very least fashionable dog breeds. He really didn't want to part with the girl and wanted to enjoy ordinary, simple human interaction, not just counting his money. And what is your name? Daniel asked. Sophie, she calmly said her name. And yours? The girl also liked this dark-eyed, handsome man. I'm Daniel. Can I treat you to some ice cream so you won't be so upset? Sophie agreed. Daniel walked past his car with an impassive look, and they went for a walk on foot. It wasn't even evening yet, but Sophie was already getting ready to go home. He really didn't want to let her go, but she said, I have an old aunt. I don't want her to worry and smiled so childishly that Daniel couldn't find anything to say in response. He asked for permission to walk her home. The girl nodded. That night Daniel barely slept. As soon as he closed his eyes, Sophie's face appeared before him. He couldn't believe it, he seemed to have fallen in love. Sophie reciprocated, and their love was so intense that everyone around them could feel its heat. Daniel confessed to Sophie that he was rich only when they decided to get married. The girl was genuinely surprised and asked, Does it matter? I think what's important are the feelings. But there was one person who didn't like their relationship at all. It was her friend Abby. She decided to steal Daniel from Sophie as soon as she met them. 
Daniel didn't even look at the beautiful Abby, but she was very interested in him. And when she found out he was that Daniel, Abby got what she wanted. Why the hell are you smiling? Who are you without me, he yelled, baffled by her reaction. Without you, I am a happy woman who will no longer allow herself to be treated like this, she said, continuing to smile, which only infuriated him more. He practically flew out of the house with his things. He left to start a new life. Martin didn't yet know that fate had a very different plan. The woman was left alone. All she did that evening was watch her favourite comedies and eat delicious food. Finally, she could allow herself to do everything she wanted. But the next day, she sat down and listed all the skills she had, then underlined what she enjoyed doing. She finally found an option where she could thrive. Of course, at first it was very hard. She searched for her first clients for a long time and earned pennies, but soon her income began to grow dramatically. She didn't even notice when she started earning several times more than she did at her office job. But Polly knew this was far from the limit of what she was capable of. She increasingly wanted to start her own business, though it took several months of painstaking work to achieve that. Four years had passed since the divorce. It was the best time of Polly's life. She was truly happy that she had been able to let go of someone who didn't value her so easily. She blossomed with each passing day, enjoying her life and work. It seemed to her that not only she was changing, but the whole world around her as well. She changed both externally and internally, growing as a professional, a wife and a mother. She managed to reach the level she had dreamed of, but didn't even think about stopping. Martin sat at a small shabby table. It was covered with an old faded oilcloth, and the paint on the legs was peeling. He was cleaning dried fish, placing the scales and bones next to a tall glass of cheap swill he called beer. He wrinkled his nose, thinking only about how much his life had changed. He had been a successful worker, planning to conquer the career ladder. In his opinion, by this time he should have become the president of the company at least, surpassing the record of the previous boss but everything went wrong. He quickly lost his authority, none of the existing bosses wanted to leave their established positions, and the die-hard careerist was simply thrown off that very career ladder. He had hit rock-bottom jobless, with a pregnant wife whose personality turned out to be far from as sweet and smooth as her beautiful body. But even that body had lost its allure, leaving only a blurred tattoo that once excited him. Now, that ink blotch only repelled him. When their daughter was born, he found a job at a modest company with a salary half of what he used to earn. Then his wife got pregnant again, and he had to take on a night job. Now, he worked like a dog just to support his wife and two kids. Marion was nothing like his ex-wife who could help support and cook. This one couldn't even cook properly. After her first childbirth, Marion went from 45 kg to 60 kgg, and after the second, she ballooned to 80 kg. Now her weight was approaching 90 kg because the only comfort Marion found was in food, and the fattier and sweeter the food, the better. Going to drink again, Marion asked in a haughty tone as she entered the kitchen. She looked at him like he was a worthless, incapable person. You should take another job. We don't have enough money. What the hell, Mariam? Go work yourself, the man reacted nervously. But he immediately received a smack on the head. Listen, you jerk. Yell at your buddies behind the garages. I'm the mother of three children. Don't you dare raise your voice at me. Do I have to listen to this? Yeah, right. I regret marrying you every single day. A poor, completely hopeless guy that can't even be looked at without tears. I shouldn't have taken you away from your ex-wife. You both would have wallowed in poverty and I would have found myself a decent man, Mariam ranted, waving her arms energetically. Oh, don't start. She's probably begging somewhere, useless. What's she capable of? Probably sold the house just to get a piece of bread. The man laughed genuinely but calmed down when he received another smack on the head. The man sat on the couch, settling his three-year-old daughter on his lap. 
His wife took their one-year-old baby. Silence fell as they tried not to argue in front of the children. They turned on the TV and watched the news. Today, millionaire Philip Brown arrived at the children's oncology hospital with his wife. Mr. Brown and his wife decided to sponsor the facility, provide equipment, cut, and do major renovations. Mr. Brown also announced that he would completely replace the hospital's equipment and sign contracts with charitable organizations that treat children with cancer, the anchor said. The screen showed a man descending from a private plane, followed by a beautiful woman to whom he offered his hand. God, that's your ex-wife, Mariam shouted, pointing at the woman. That can't be, the man shouted and pressed closer to the screen. But he recognized her, no matter how painful this truth was. He immediately went to social media to find this oligarch and look at photos with his wife. Naturally, Polly was in all the pictures. I can't believe it. How is this possible? He went to her page and scrolled further. He discovered that she had started her own business, becoming a successful businesswoman long before she got married. He shivered with rage. If he hadn't divorced her, he'd be swimming in money now, not struggling with children in poverty. He started pacing the room, not knowing how to contain his anger. Your ex-wife is useless, you say. What a fool. You divorced her. Mariam shouted again and again, laughing hysterically. She saw how much her reaction irritated him, but she wanted him to feel bad, even for a moment. The next day, Martin couldn't take it any more. He went to the airport, knowing that his wife was arriving today. He wanted to talk to her, to see her in person. Maybe he could rekindle her old feelings, maybe he could stir up that love again. He stood by the barrier, shouting and shouting at her. She looked in his direction and walked over. Attentive security guards followed her. Hi, it's me, don't you recognize me? Martin asked hopefully, his voice trembling. But it was as if she didn't recognize him. The eyes were familiar, but the stubble, the bloated face, the unkempt and overweight appearance were not. Darling, who is this? asked the man, taking her by the arm. Some beggar. Here, take this, just spend it on food, not on booze, she replied, handing Martin some money. She really didn't recognize him at all. He took the money she offered and just stood there, watching the couple walk hand in hand toward an expensive car. They got into the back seat and the driver pulled out of the parking lot. A car with security guards followed. Martin stood there. Even when the car disappeared among the other vehicles, holding the money in his hands. He shoved it into his pocket and trudged back to his old car. Tears of bitterness and disappointment streamed down his face. It was painful for him to realize that his wife now lived in luxury while he languished at the bottom of life. If you like the story, please support me with the thumbs up button. It's just one click for you, but it's very important to me. Thank you.